today why the single family build to rent model is booming. And is Amazon good stock to buy right now? This is Invest Talk independent thinking, shared success. Aloha, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Monday, June 24th, 2024 edition. And summer is officially here. And I said aloha because I'm officially back from. My vacation, we were in Kauai for uh, the week. I still feel the island breeze a little bit. It was the first time I've been to Kauai since uh, I was a little, little kid. So pretty much my first time. And uh, it it was great. Um, Had the best scallops of my life. Went on the best hike of my life through the uh, Nepali coast. So it was a great rest and relaxation time uh, for me and my fiance. And we're back. We are back here to help you, and I'm excited for it. I'm excited for this hour to discuss what's been going on with markets, and most importantly, discuss what is happening with you. That's what the show is about. It's about you, your financial situation, and the lessons that you can learn to further your financial position. And we always say, it's not one decision that's going to make or break you. Well, I guess it could break you make a really, really bad decision. But you know, our goal here is to keep you on the straight and narrow, not veering off, not making emotional, rash decisions, focusing on the path in front of you and the market that you're presented with. Not the world that you hope it will be, but what is. And we will call the shots as we see them and hopefully give you some perspective that can color your own thinking. So you bring the right mindset to your decision-making process. That's, that's, that's the uh, correct way to look at everything. Now, if you show up at your job, you're not engaged, you're probably not going to do a good job. You show up at the dinner table with your family, you're probably, and, you're, and you're not engaged in the conversation, you're probably not going to have a good connection. So mindset across every aspect of life, is extremely important. And so this is our hour to set the mindset, give you the information, so that you can be on your own path to financial freedom. Now, in just a little bit, we'll talk about today's market performance, as well as run down some show topics. But first, as usual, we will tackle this caller question now. Hi, I'm calling back about Amazon, ticker A-M-Z-N. I was wondering how you felt about the company, and if you take a look at the charts, do you think this pullback is enough to get back in? Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Oh, well, I don't know what pullback you're talking about. I mean, you had a down day today, but it's still near a 52-week high. Now, the there is some MACD divergence on the chart, so the momentum is waning, just like it is for uh, most of the large cap tech stocks you're seeing, uh, NVIDIA, uh, peak just recently. Uh, and, you know, if if the tech sector does roll over earnest, Amazon will come down with it. Now, our Amazon is supposed to earn $5.10 this year, $6.39 next year. So if you're going based on forward looking earnings, this is trading somewhere in the 30 times multiple, which is pretty expensive, if, especially if you look at its revenue growth, which is slowed, which makes sense. It's a very large company now doing $170 billion in sales every single quarter. So it's hard to grow that that much sales uh, at a fast clip. So I'm not willing to pay that that high multiple, maybe the high, maybe the low 20s, but not the low 30s like it is now. So I think it needs to come down. I would not be buying it here. Like I said, momentum is waning, it is expensive. Uh, and I think it, there needs to be a reset across the tech space. Uh, there's a lot of hot money there, and it looks like it may be leaving in the near term. So I would pass on Amazon for now, but as usual, there's always a price that would make sense, but it's probably 30% lower from here. Okay, so that's going to put you somewhere in the 120 range, 125 in that area. That's where I'd pick up. Amazon. Okay. Thanks for the call. 
Now, we have a lot to cover in the next 45 minutes, and time permitting, we will get to all of it. Our main focus point is in regards to why single-family build-to-rent homes are booming in the United States. A single-family build-to-rent market has been a remar- been, has seen a remarkable surge in recent years with a share of new homes built specifically for rental purposes growing from just 5% in 2021 to 10% in 2023. Driven by a combination of factors, including changing demographics, shifting lifestyle preferences, and the impact of the pandemic. So what does that mean for the future of real estate and most importantly, rental real estate? So I'm going to give you the lay of the land and how I see it right now. We have other topics on the docket as well. One is in regards to airlines. You might have seen that the airline traffic is near record highs, but you look at the airline stocks, they are not. Many of them are down a lot. U.S. airline stocks are down roughly 40% over the last five years. So why is that? We'll dig into that story and why, you know, airline stocks should probably be at the top of your list of companies to be buying almost ever. Also, industrial policy. China grew its economy dramatically based on its industrial policy, driven from the top down. And the United States, as well as the rest of the world, starting to implement their own version of uh, industrial policy. And uh, there is there are ways to do it right, and there are ways to do it wrong. So we're going to dig into what to look for to see whether the United States or other countries are implementing this correctly. And then lastly, how are young people spending their money? We'll dig into that story as well. We also have some voice bank questions. One is on non-qualified deferred compensation plans and CBYYX. It's a pioneer bond fund. We also have some questions submitted via the comment section over on our YouTube channel. And of course, we welcome your finance and investment questions Right now at 888.99 chart, we love those live calls. So if you're listening via the live stream or an AM1220 in the Silicon Valley area, you can call right now. Now we're going to a short break. And on the other side, we'll talk about today's market activity. And please remember, you can call anytime and leave your question on the InvestTalk Voice Bank at 888.99 chart. Enjoyed our insights on InvestTalk? Great news. Our podcast is available on all major platforms. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Get the latest in investment advice across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Subscribe now and join our community of informed investors. Now, let's take a look at the market today. It was decidedly mixed, but mainly driven by the downdraft in large cap tech. Simple as that. NVIDIA was down uh, nearly 7% on the day. If you include after hours moves, it's down over 7%. Sirius XM down 8%. Tesla down a, a little bit. Amazon about, down about 2%. So you're starting to see that exhaustion in the AI trade. SMCI was down as well, uh, down $78, nearly 10% on the day. So some big losers in the AI space. ResMed, that was uh, in the medical space, down nearly 12%. Let's see, what else? MicroStrategy, Bitcoin uh, looks pretty weak. I think Bitcoin is likely to head lower into August. And that is typically a proxy for liquidity. So that whole craze into the Bitcoin ETFs, it just shows you, you know, those, those things tend to be flash in the pan type of short term movements that you want to, if you're going to play, you want to be quick in and quick out. And that trade is starting to unwind there. Uh, you know, if you throw out large cap growth stocks today, Market did pretty well. Small caps were up over half a percent. Mid caps up a half a percent. You had small cap value up one point one percent. Mid caps over up over one. Sorry, mid cap value up over one percent. 
and large cap value up nearly 1%, 0.88% there. So you're starting to see this market shift. You had big volume on Friday in the S&P. Part of that was quarterly OPEX. So that's a, that colors it a little bit. Um, but that's another reason why, you know, gamma squeeze start, gamma squeezes start to unwind post OPEX. And you, you, you also have the uh, uh, summer solstice. You often get market turns at that time as well. Uh, and what I say here is I don't really think it's a market turn. I just think it's a, a, a shift. You know, uh, the industrial space did well today. Uh, energy stocks did well today. Uh, material stocks did well today. And really, the, the hot trades in AI, that, that's the only thing that's been, been driving the markets to new high highs. But you're starting to see that catch-up trade, money flowing into those things that were have been underperforming for the past, uh, let's, say, let's say, since the beginning of the quarter. Um, and you're starting to see money flow out of uh, the, the AI trade overall. So uh, just understand that we're at the start of this in my mind. And you need to, if you need to reassess your portfolio, right? a lot of those names have gone up a lot. You might be overweight, many of them. And this is now a time. Now you've seen the turn you want to rebalance because typically it's not something that ends in just a few days. Right, the, the peak was three, four days ago for a lot of these names. And I know they're down a lot and everyone wants to get back to the highs, but you're probably not seeing those highs for an extended period of time. Maybe ever on some of those names, right? The MSCI, SMCIs of the world, et cetera. So a lot of those names, smaller names that were hyped up because of AI, uh, you know, they were way, way overstretched. Even NVIDIA, you may never see, right? You could, see, you could have a, a Cisco situation where, you know, it still isn't back to its uh, 2000 highs, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, upcoming this week, but um, that's kind of the market that I am seeing right now. You had the dollar down, you had gold prices up a little bit, uh, silver prices up. So harder assets are gaining in favor. And I think uh, this whole AI craze has kept the tech multiples at more elevated than they should be uh, for longer than they should be. But that's how markets are. They tend to run away with a narrative and get ahead of themselves. You see that multiple times since the pandemic. It happened first in, you know, the Zooms of the world, the DocuSigns, the companies that benefited so much from the pandemic, extrapolated this huge growth. And when that growth didn't materialize, those stocks shrink dramatically. So these are lessons that you have to learn. You have to be aware. If you're, if you're going to, you know, just shift with the winds uh, and, and, and chase headlines and chase the big performers, you're not going to do well. Unless you're a quick hitter and you're just trying to play short timeframes, you know, swing trades, things like that. You can be successful if you're disciplined, if you're smart, and if that's the way, type of investor that you want to have, you, or you want to be. If, if you have the data, you have the discipline, you have the, the, the charts, you, you have the time to study this, look for chart patterns, and develop a strategy, yeah, you can do it. But more often than not, you don't have those things. You may develop them over time, but especially new investors, they're not very good at that. So let this be another lesson that these, these periods are, they're short, they're quick, they're powerful, but they're very rarely sustained. So that's where we are as we close the first uh, day of this week. And is this the last week of the quarter? Yeah, it is. Last week of the quarter. Here we go. Now we're moving into a break, but I'm taking your calls now. So give me a call now at 888-99-CHART. Did you love today's Invest Talk episode? Well, we want to hear from you. So drop your investing questions in the comments below, and your question could be the star of our next segment. Subscribe and stay tuned to see if your question gets answered by us. Dive into the comments now and become a part of our next conversation.
Now, our main focus point today concerns this story. Why single-family built-to-rent homes are booming in the United States. And, you know, more built-for-rent single-family homes are being constructed here. In the first quarter, 18,000 began construction. And that's a 20% jump compared to the first quarter of last year. So the numbers, the demand uh, continues to go up. And the share of all housing starts that are single family built for rent starts grew to 10% last year, and that's from 5% in 2021. And so in all of last year, you had 90,000 units up from 81,000 in 2022. And there's obviously a housing shortage in the United States. And I think there's multiple reasons. Number one, people are living longer. I know average life expectancy is, has come down recently, um, but people in general over the years uh, are living longer. Also, and living in their homes longer, okay, because uh, they have the financial wherewithal to do so. So not moving to reti- you know, a, a assisted living or anything like that as, as much as they were in the past. And number two is, I, I think it's underappreciated, underreported on, and that is the Airbnb market, right? The short-term rental market. Because you're essentially taking that volume off the market and turning them into mini hotels. They're no longer single family homes. They're no longer condos. They're no longer for places for people to live. They are places for people to visit, just like a hotel. And I think that is drastically underappreciated. And as long as the demand for travel continues to stay relatively robust, unemployment remains relatively low, the numbers will generally pencil out better to keep them as short-term rentals. Now, if you go into a recession you'll, and you've, you've been through a recession before, you know that hotels don't do nearly as well because people are traveling less. So I think a lot of this is cyclical. And I think there's an especially tight market for single family homes more than say apartments or condos or townhomes. Numbers actually show that multifamily units, large apartment complexes, there's actually beginning to be an oversupply of those. So that's going to bring the pressure on rents down. So I think if you own a condo, you own properties that are comparable to apartments, those those rental that rental market's likely in most areas going to struggle. Once again, r- real estate is very localized, so you can't when I say this, I'm lo- I'm talking in generalities. You're going to have pockets of strength especially in areas that continue to see net inward migration. Think of the South and Southeast. And out of the big population centers. Think San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Chicago, etc. So this built for rent single family home demand, I think is likely to stay relatively robust especially because a lot of the of the entities, I don't say people because they aren't people, entities that are buying these homes are those on Wall Street, right? The Black Rocks of the world. And they have l- higher borrowing costs, but still borrowing costs that are low enough to make many of these properties pencil out. Now, will that always be the case? No. I think this is go- actually this build to rent model is going to make Home prices generally more volatile, generally. The good thing is that this is money that, or a new source of demand that will push more units out there into the marketplace. And that's what's needed because of the chronic underproduction of homes post financial crisis. A lot of the home builders were, you know, they were scarred. Some of them almost went bankrupt. 
And so they more built to demand. And this is another source of demand. Yes, it's crowding out some individual buyers, but that's a question I think for government more than markets, right? Should they should there be should we allow the black rocks of the world to buy up tens of thousands of homes? That's another question. Okay. Now the cost to rent a single family home in May was $2,262, a 4.7% increase from a year earlier. Rent price on a multifamily building in May was $1,896. That was up 2.6%. So you can see that lagging on the multifamily side from the growth in rents on the single family side. And so that sums it up right there. I think there will continue to be increasing demand, increasing, uh, yeah, increasing demand for single family homes and an increasingly over, increasing oversupply of multifamily. Think of, think of apartments, think of uh, condos. Okay. Now we're heading into a break. But I'm ready to take your calls. And on the next, oh, I'll preview next the next show coming up. But I'm taking your calls live at 888 chart Eight 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 ninety nine chart eight eight nine nine two four two seven eight. So I get through and ask your question on today's show. Now on the next invest talk, sorry, on the next invest talk, we will look into this story. Nvidia stock surges, then stumbles. What's next for investors? Nvidia stock has been on a roller coaster ride lately, surging to unprecedented heights before experiencing a sudden and sharp pullback. This dramatic turn of events has left investors and analysts alike wondering what led to Nvidia's meteoric rise and what factors are behind its recent tumble. What lies in its future as well? We'll get to that story tomorrow, but now let's pivot back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier. Good evening, guys. This is Griffin Iowa calling about a question regarding non qualified deferred spending savings accounts offered through my employer. And this is in addition to the regular 401k option to defer to 100%. Interestingly enough, of your of your total compensation into this plan. And the expense ratios are the lowest would be like 0.9. The highest is around 1.4. And I was questioning that because it seemed high to me. And then I sent a message to our principal broker and they sent me a PRISM, P-R-I-S-M, fee benchmark analysis. And it says that uh, our employee-sponsored plan is on the low end of whatever prism is. I was just looking to see if you guys are familiar with this and what a good expense ratio would be for a non-qualified, I guess, 404 plan, and if that would be something worth doing some tax deferral into. Thank you. Well, this is a a complex one because I I don't know how big of a plan you are. Uh, So I'll I'll step back and talk about employee-sponsored, employer-sponsored plans. And we manage these for clients. We so if you ever need help with your four hundred one k, four hundred three b, four hundred one a, five five twenty nine, four fifty seven, we 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 handle all those. Um. Now, every plan has a different fee structure. And it typically does go down as the size of the plan goes up. So that's mainly because the administration costs, think of all the legal filings that you have to do in order to keep the plan compliant, because these are, you know, a 401k is a section of the tax code, and that is, you know, what, what 401ks are based off of. And so there are audits that need to be done. There's a lot of just overhead with plans. So as the number of assets in the plan goes up, well, you can spread out those costs among more participants and more money. And so what is that? I mean, PRISM's a good example. 
Um, but they're probably looking at your entire plan as opposed to the, the deferred comp part of your plan. Okay. And most employers have the 401k side and they have deferred comp as well. So this is probably something I can't answer on the show because I don't know enough data. This is something we typically talk to clients deeper about. What are your options? How much should you defer? Etc. Um, so if you want to schedule a portfolio review with me, we can just go over this and you can give me more information and I can tell you whether what makes sense for you. Because a lot will depend on your goals as well. How much are you uh, currently have in your retirement accounts? What's your retirement goal? Are you retiring early, retiring at 65 or 70? Um, are you planning to buy a second home? Um, send a kid to college? What's your emergency fund look like? All of these are things that need to be discussed in context to whether or not you should defer any of that comp or not. And if so, how much? So I appreciate that you're looking into this, but uh, I would love to have a more direct conversation with you. So I encourage you to schedule that portfolio review. Now, I hope you've been telling your friends that our Invest Talk audio podcast is also available in video form over on our YouTube channel. And it seems every day now we get new questions via the comment section on those YouTube videos. This one came in yesterday. Eric Don says, you guys mentioned ERF a few days ago as a good Canadian energy stock. You might have been listening to an older show because I, I don't think we've uh, talked about that one in a while. But he says, it struck my interest. I tried to pick some up on Schwab, but the trade would not go through. After talking to a rep, they said they weren't sure what was up with the stock, but it hadn't traded since February. And yeah, that's a good for a good reason, because they were bought out. And like you said in your comment, she also mentioned it looks like a company was acquired by Cord Industry, Cord Energy, excuse me, CHRD. Now we owned ERF for clients and it was bought out. Now we did sell it before Cord bought it. Uh, just reassessing the position in Cord. Not that we didn't like Cord in general, uh, but we just found other options that we thought were better for that capital. Okay. Uh, you said it looks like interesting as a 6% yield. Since I sold most of my Enbridge, would Cord be a good place to put it? Well, I would say I like it better than Enbridge because it's more of a pure play, whereas Enbridge has other uh, you know, utility assets, et cetera. But, you know, is it my favorite Canadian oil play? No. Or oil play in general. Sorry. That, you know, or ERF was a Canadian play. Cord is domestic-based here in the U.S., but now it has some exposure to Canada. Um, like I said, Cord is fine. I don't dislike it. Uh, I just think there's better uh, within the industry. Okay. Thanks for the call. Let's go talk to Eric in Kentucky. He wants to talk about NVIDIA. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, so <clears throat> I did something you, you probably would be very upset about. Did you pull I, a I Kathy Wood? Index. I'm sorry. Did, did you top tick NVIDIA? I don't know if anyone, anyone caught that. Uh, yeah. So, the, 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 yeah. The Kathy but, Wood uh, story where she uh, sold it, you, I don't know, before its big move, and she literally just bought it back last week and top ticked <laughs> NVIDIA. Uh, but go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, like and my buddy, who's a doctor, he's like, he's had it since January of 22. And last Thursday, I was like, all right, man, I'll put some in. But he didn't tell me to. I just jumped in it like FOMO. And what it is, um, and I love your, your podcast, but I've had, I usually just do index funds. So I've been doing it for 30 years, but I never do single stocks. So I had about, 50, I had a 15 grand in FTEC, which is Fidelity's IT fund for the last three years. So out of like, I have about a hundred grand in that, so I took fifteen out, put it in Nvidia. As soon, I literally, I'm telling you, man, as soon as I bought it, it started going down, and it's like the Eric effect. So I, I let it go down until I lost eight hundred bucks, and then I sold it, and I'm like, what the hell did I just do? What the heck did I just do? So ultimately, like long term from the FTEC, I didn't really lose anything. But my point is, is like single stocks, I don't have the emotional stability for the volatility, I guess, but. Mm -hmm. I was curious from your professional standpoint in the near future, is this fall just a normal correction pullback or do you feel that the IT sector overall with NVIDIA headlining it, this is the start of like a, like a 
back to earth, normal evaluation situations. I think it's, I think it's the latter. I think it's going to, it's going to go back to earth and, you know, not like NVIDIA is going anywhere. It's not going to be over, but you know, if you just study the history of uh, these manias, if you study the history of the semiconductor space, you know that uh, it's a very cyclical business Uh, and it's all about the CapEx cycle. And the growth in NVIDIA as of late has been all about CapEx towards AI. And that's a real thing. I don't think AI is going anywhere. But is it going to have the same level of investment as it has recently? Because you're going from having zero capabilities in AI to something, right? That's that's what people are, are really building out. But a lot of those people that spent, or I don't say people, but companies that spent uh, to develop AI tools many of them are going to fail. They're not going to build very good tools. And even if they are good, they're not going to be good at marketing it and turning it into a profitable business. And so those people, those, those companies are going to stop spending because maybe they'll bankrupt or maybe they shift directions in the company. Okay. Also, the big question I think is still up in the air is how well can even the large players monetize AI? Is AI going to be table stakes to get in for any piece of software? They're building AI tools into all the Microsoft software, all the uh, you know Microsoft Copilot, et cetera. But does that mean you're going to pay more for 365 than you were before? Because maybe Google is going to build them into you know their suite of um, you know uh, of software. I think of uh, Sheets and its, its online tools. So will it drive enough incremental revenue? And, and that's really the question. It can't be both ways, right? It can't be that it's, it can't be that um, NVIDIA's business is going to keep going up and the profit margins of these software companies continue to go up as well. It's just not going to work. Because you have so much CapEx going to building out uh, this infrastructure. And that's going to squeeze the margins of the Googles, of the Amazons, of the Metas, et cetera, of the Microsofts. I think I read an article, it's uh, six, was it 40 or 60% of uh, NVIDIA's revenue is coming from those four top names. And not all of them are going to succeed. And so it's a CapEx cycle. And I think that's going to be the story of the back end of 2024, back half of 2024, is, hey, growth is going to slow in NVIDIA. Because these companies just can't spend the same amount of money without drastically shrinking their margins. Once again, it doesn't mean NVIDIA is a bad company. It's going to hell in a handbasket or anything like that. It's just there's a lot of expectations built into the stock today. So as of just a few days ago, right, it was the largest company in the world by market cap. And it had, what, a tenth of the revenue of Apple? It just doesn't make sense. Does not compute, (laughs) pun intended. So it's likely the top is, you know, could keep going, right? It had this setback in March. It kind of chopped sideways for a little bit. and then you know, surged back higher. But this move, especially after today, is a bit different. You have three major days down on high volume. And the Eric effect, the uh, Kathy Wood effect, right? She's a large destroyer of capital and she just put money in uh, at the highest market cap in the world. It's not a recipe for success. And it's a good, good lesson for everyone out there. When your cousin, your friend, the person at a party tells you you should go buy something, especially when they're not a professional. I think you said you was a doctor friend. Correct. I live with a doctor. <laughs> I, I live with a doctor. Hey, yeah. Trust me, doctors are not the place you, you typically want to. Uh, yeah. follow their investment advice. <laughs> Most of them are very bad at, at, at managing money and, and investments. They think they're very smart and, and a lot of them are smart in that one thing. You know, sure. my fiance would say, she'll, she's very smart. She's one of the top dermatologists in the entire country. 
She knows nothing. She knows nothing about the investment world or just managing money in general. I have to help her. All right. So, it, you know, this is uh, it's just a lesson. You know, it's, it's, you, it's an eight hundred dollar lesson for you. And take it as that. Move on and, and make sure you, you know, don't repeat it. Definitely. Um, do you just curious and because I'm not going to do it. And personally, like me, uh, I have no I'm good with what I do in medical sales. And I know that I would have to get a professional like yourself and, or Steve, because you guys I've listened to you guys for years, even as an index investor, you've given to me a platform to kind of just know about money management and other things within the investing community. So I definitely thank you for that. But uh, just curious, like if you foresee this with NVIDIA um, and with future competition within the AI realm, and I'm not doing it myself, but just maybe to your listeners who might be interested, what would you, you think would be a good uh, price to buy back into the stock? Oh, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a difficult, I mean, I can look at a chart and I can give you support levels, things like that. Uh, but it, it's going to be drastically lower, right? I can give you, I'll give you a technical support level. Uh, it's going to be $60. Now, the, the real support is probably closer to 50, right? But you're talking, the first major support will down, be down at 91. It's at 118 now. Um, then you have 75 and then 60 is the big support around 50 to 60. Uh, but you also have to call it when you get there, right? If if uh, their earnings, which are expected to be, let's see, $3.42 next year, if they're heading back to, you know, sub $2, is it still worth $60? Maybe not, right? Um, so a lot will depend on how the CapEx cycle evolves. Um, so I can't say yet because you just got the top. Right. It's it's not <laughs> these things don't happen overnight. Let's look at, you know, Zoom, you know, Zoom is still uh, trying to find its bottom. Um, so and I think it's still going to be wildly more successful than Zoom. I'm not saying it but like that. I'm just saying you have to look at history and know that these things take time. You will have it in your watch list. It's probably not going to be a good buy for at least six months, you know, maybe a few years. OK. Thanks for the call now let's uh let's see well after the break i'm going to touch a bit on what's i gonna touch on ah airline stocks i love this topic one of my first lessons when i started out in this biz and we'll get to that after this break but this is invest talk i'm justin klein we have one goal here is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom when our work continues after this final break so get your questions in now at 888 chart Hey, welcome to InvestTalk. I'm Justin. And I'm Luke. Together, we're here to guide you through the maze of investing and give you insights that impact your portfolio. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just getting started, we've got you covered with the latest trends, opportunities, and expert advice. We take your calls every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific and anytime on our InvestTalk listener line. Just call 888-99-CHART. We'll bring you deep dives into market analysis and answer your burning questions. So why join us? To get ahead in your investment journey with strategies, tips, and knowledge that can unlock the full potential of your hard-earned money. But first, hit subscribe, turn your notifications on, and let's start making informed investment decisions together. Welcome, Welcome to InvestTalk. Hi, Justin. Hi, Luke. This is Bruce from New York. Great show as always. I have been getting into charting over the past year. I have an unusual question. I use Fidelity Investments for their excellent tools. Uh, they switched from simple support and resistance lines to asking the user to select one of four methods. The four methods are dollar risk box, prime number bands, super trend, and volume profiles. I selected volume profiles because I thought it was the most useful. I was wondering which one, if any, that you guys use for your support and resistance analysis. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Well, I'm not sure what they mean by volume profiles. I would imagine it would be where volume 
is we'll use something like that uh, where it's basically volume at price. So uh, that is part of the tools. Uh, we typically use more like Fibonacci retracements. We use uh, previous pivot points, consolidation areas, uh, breakout uh, areas, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm not sure what the other ones are. Uh, like I said, I think volume profiles might be volume at price. Yeah, I think that's what, what it would be. So I would use those more often because what happens is when there's a lot of shares traded at a particular price, that typically the, mark, the, the stock runs into a roadblock there because what happens is if it's going up into it, now there's a lot of people that were stuck and now they're back to even, right? They were at a loss. Oh my God, I'm a loss. And the psychology of it, okay, I'm back to even. Let me get out. I'm back to even. Okay. And same thing happens on sh shorting, right? They short a stock and it goes up and it comes back down. Right, they were down because it was going up, and now it goes back to that price, and there's support there at that price as well. So, uh, that I rather use the volume profiles uh, more than those other ones. Thanks for the call. Now, let's talk a little about the airline industry. This is one lesson that I learned a long time ago, and it was my one of the most interesting ones that my grandfather taught me, which was, don't buy airline stocks. And this goes back to a few lessons, uh, it just, which is buy good businesses. Buy good businesses. And good businesses tend to be not very cyclical. They tend to be have low capital intensity. And therefore, their business tends to not be as up and down because uh, they don't have a lot of fixed costs. And... Airlines are the opposite of the type of business that you want to be in, right? It's very cyclical. And even times like this where the demand is high, the supply of other things are squeezing the margins, right? Think of the supply of uh, oil. Oil prices are higher. On top of that, you have labor costs. And then problems with the planes, right? Shortage of cabin and crew. You have shortage of air traffic controllers. All of this is increasing their cost per mile. Spirit, for example, Spirit Airlines, low cost. In 2021, analysts expected the cost per mile to go from 6.7 cents to 5.7 by 2024. Instead, it's up to 7.3. And what's interesting here is that the, there's been a boom in what we call premium economy. So some people are, are trading up, right? They don't want the no frills. They don't have to pay for extra baggage. They want to be able to pick their seat, et cetera. And so premium economy is actually booming. The problem is, is that the business traveler is not. The latest forecast by the U.S. Travel Association says on an inflation-adjusted basis, Spending on business travel will be down 13% from 2019 levels. Okay. And so they're not paying for business class. They're, they're, and those that are spending are, are spending less, right? They're, they're not buying business class. They're buying the premium economy. And also supply is going up. So the number of seats in the United States is up 8% from 2019 levels. So overcapacity is a big problem as well. And that historically has been a big problem with airline stocks, airline companies. They just build too many routes. So this is a lesson that even in a high demand situation does not translate to higher profits 100% of the time. And most investors don't appreciate that. They only look at demand. They do not focus at su on supply. You have to look at both. If you do not understand both, you do not understand the big picture. If you, don't, if you don't understand supply, you don't understand half of it. Literally. No, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening. And we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And I hope you've heard... The Invest Talk podcast is also available in video form over on our YouTube channel. So head over there and subscribe. 
Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more amazing content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your support means the world to us and helps us create more videos that you love. Subscribe now and join our community of savvy investors.